Welcome back to CodingCat.dev, where we give you cats the freshest dose of dev snacks. Here is Alex Patterson and Brittany Postma. This episode brought to you by Storyblock. Build anything and publish everywhere. What up, perfect peeps? We don't have Brittany today, unfortunately. She couldn't make this one, but uh, she said to say hello, and she uh, wanted to be here. So unfortunately, she... Uh, kind of dating myself here, but she flew to Denver. So if you're listening to this later, hopefully uh, you, you saw her in Denver, maybe. <laughs> Anyways, we have Dav on with us today. We're going to talk all about uh, Fly.io, kind of break down what it is. Um, and then we'll we'll dive into like what you would use it for and things like that. But first, I want to know more about Dav. So Dav, do you have an introduction for me? Yeah, hi. So I'm Dove Elbrin. I'm a platform engineer at fly.io. Um, so that means I get to wrangle our VMs around the world and uh, fight with networking and all the fun stuff that comes with trying to uh, run huge distributed systems at scale. So, nice. uh, that's, so that's what, what led I do. you to, to fly? What's your background? Are you a back end engineer, a front end engineer? So uh, I was this is my first full-time job in the tech space so i did freelance stuff before uh and so that was you know like all over them all over the place what type of stuff i built um and then i got into fly.io actually through open source um i was trying to move a client's stuff to fly uh just because i thought it was interesting as a consumer and there wasn't a terraform provider so i wanted there to be a terraform provider so i wrote one and I posted on the forum. Turns out other people wanted one of those. And that began uh, a sort of uh, now year and a half long relationship in some form or another with Fly. Wow, that's pretty incredible. Like, that's one of the coolest stories I've heard from open source. Not that I haven't heard them before. Like, usually, like, you start getting into that repo and kind of start uh, adding things and adding features and requesting things. And all of a sudden, it's like, man, this guy's doing so much work. We should hire him, right? Yeah, I mean, so the 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 you know it was it was good timing because our machines product was the the sort of v zero of that uh, fly was launching at the same time that I had started posting with this Terraform provider to the forum, and so I got a message from uh, Joshua at Fly who works on our integrations with our partners, and uh, he messaged me and sent me a link to these beta docs for the machines API and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the Terraform provider supported this. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if the Terraform provider supported this? And we sort of, you know, stared at each other over the keyboard and then offered me a contracting gig and it all went went from there. That's really cool. That's such an awesome story. Well, so what's your what's your background? It sounds like DevOps was a thing in your background. What what programming languages were you working on, you know, kind of leading up to that? Um, so before that, the sort of open source stuff that I did and for de, for customers was mostly like uh, Node React based stuff uh, on React based stuff on the front end, and then uh, Node based stuff on uh, the back end with a little bit of Go uh, here and there. That's really cool. Go is an interesting language. I still haven't quite wrapped my head around it. I'm more of a TypeScript guy myself, so. Go is now. That's that's what I think in daily. That's that's a lot of our stuff at Fly is wow. written in. So that's that's my new, that's, that's my really new cool. go too. I love it. Um, when you were kind of leading into to Fly.io, uh, or even before that, I should say, like, did you take the traditional university path and like learn some languages, or was it all kind of self taught, self learned as you went along? Uh, I'm I'm self taught. Um, I'm actually I'm working towards a degree now um, to try and uh, I, I'm in school to try and get a more uh, academic understanding of some things that I have, you know, purely like pragmatic experience with. Sure. Because I do think some of that is uh, valuable. But by the time that I started with uh, Fly, I was I was self-taught. That's completely amazing. I, I keep going through this. So I have a 14 year old now and it's kind of one of these things we keep chatting about, like what's college really for? Like I was always taught growing up, it's to get a job and get paid. And now it's kind of one of these things that you really have to wrestle with how much money you kind of want to go through on school. And like a lot of times it used to be just for grades. And I love that you're kind of going back to like 
kind of get that deep dive and have a structured way to dive back into it. Yeah. I mean, so like I was, it, I'm, I'm fairly young. Um, I'm almost 20. Um, so my, it was, it was really a choice around that time, which direction I wanted to go. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm very lucky. I found a program that sort of lets me take the real world experience I have and apply that towards a degree. That's uh, really cool. Yeah. It's, it's a big challenge. I remember, uh, getting my master's degree, you know, that was six hours a week on top of 40 hours plus probably more like 50 hours of work and just uh, such a grind. I'm twice your age actually. So it's, uh, starting to become a little blurry all the, all the way back when that was. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, uh, as far as like kind of getting up to speed and things like that, were there hurdles when you started at fly? Did you have to like start to break down and understand like the Git flow more or anything like that when you started working for a company? Uh, Git, I was pretty familiar with coming from like an open source background since that had been where a lot of like my like hard technical experience had sure. come from. Cause a lot of like freelance stuff is very, that's like extremely pragmatic. We have a goal. We need a thing to do this exact thing. Uh, right. But then a lot of open sources where I had a lot more of that theoretical experience, but it was definitely, you know, there were a lot of things that you jump into and suddenly, uh, you know, I didn't have any experience with like networking is a huge part of, I think we'll talk about later. A uh, big yeah. part of fly is like the networking overlay, which was something I had very little experience with. So that was a lot of, you know, learning that type of stuff. That's a, it, it's not an easy thing to learn either. Like, especially when you're kind of coming in it from a programming perspective and you yeah. haven't taken <laughs> all the, the like networking classes and what the heck's a layer seven, you know, like terms just start getting thrown around like crazy. So I did architecture yeah. consulting for a while and man, it's just jargon after a while that people start throwing out at you and kind of breaking down every time you go into consulting and, and stuff like that. So props to you for, for being exactly. able to dive into that. I mean, it's always, you know, I, it's, it's always fun explaining to people, you know, the, some of the weirdest on calls I've had have been stuff breaking because an undersea cable gets broken, and, you know, <sighs> trying to explain to people <laughs> why that why the internet is actually still held together with uh, duct tape and submarine cables. Wow. I, I would have never guessed that. I love that story, by the way. How often does that occur? Um, I mean, not just for you guys, but like in general, like what a boat's anchor kind of clips something or. I, I think that gets slightly into, I'm not sure what I'm allowed to talk about territory okay, That's fair. since <laughs> specific instances are cables belonging to specific companies. And I don't know what the, what the, yep story is there but it's it's more it's more common than you'd think uh just if you I mean like if you think of it you have a cable doing anything in any environment eventually it's bound to fail then the thing with these submarine cables is they just carry so much of the internet right you're trying to get yeah. anything under an ocean you're going through you're, you're going through a cable it's got to get there somehow so Absolutely. it's now if that fails that's that's way more noticeable than like if the ethernet in your house <laughs> I've seen some of those boats, like how they like roll them out. And then like, uh, you know, th at some midpoint, there's like an amplification piece to it, right? That they have to like reboost that signal. That's an incredible job and like incredible technology to run all the way across the ocean floor. Yeah. One day I want to go, I want to go learn more about the actual, how they, how they lay those things. That'll be, that'll be cool. They, they do a, so probably not specifically on this boat, but they have a vacations where you can just ride on one of the boats, like going nice. across, taking materials, doing whatever. I've always kind of wanted to do that, but on the flip side, I'm like three months at sea sounds rough. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's tough. I don't know that I could, I don't know how much I could <laughs> do that. Maybe that could be your next gig. Like you graduate, you take a pause and you go ride on a boat for a while. Right. Go lay some submarine cables. That could be that could be that could be another gig. Yeah, for sure. OK, enough enough banter about undersea cables. We're going to dive into it right after we get back from our break. How in the world could I forget about this? There's no need to freak out. We have story block. Robert, you're right. But we still need a plan. OK, how much time do we have left until the launch? 24 hours. OK, let's go.
We are ready to publish. So let's get this baby online. Thank you, Storyblock, for being one of our awesome sponsors once again. Once again. Um, so let's talk about fly.io. I have just the homepage up, which is sweet, by the way. I love the colors. As you can tell, I love purple. So it, it really uh, kind of speaks to me. What does this chart mean? Why are there balloons all over this globe? Hot air balloons, I should say. Yeah, so these are all regions where we have hardware that users can deploy uh, their apps to. And I'm not, I think this might actually be behind a few regions. We're constantly uh, adding more and growing uh, where we have availability. But what you see here is a pretty healthy sampling of uh, the regions where you can deploy your apps. For like a front end web developer, why do they care about having it in different regions or like for for someone just getting started, this might be confusing to them. Like, why would I stick my server or my application VM over in China? Like, why does that make sense? Here? Right. Well, for if you don't have any users in China, it probably doesn't. But what's right. really cool is that the second that you do have users in China, right, you're no longer having to. And China's a China's a silly example because we don't actually have any regions in China. <laughs> asterisk, asterisk. Uh, but Hong Kong is the example I always okay. use. Okay, I, I was gonna um, say let's do Africa then, but that works. Yeah, well, we've got we've got a bunch of different countries uh, in Africa, but so any any of these places, right, where um, you have users, right, and let's say you have uh, launched the greatest new social media app, Coder Cat Dev uh, social media app. It's a little bit of a clunky name, but people really <laughs> like it. It's uh, beating out Instagram, right? And your company yeah, let me, is building. Let me write this down. This sounds like an amazing product. Yeah, there you go. This is this is this one's a freebie. This is it. Um, and you start, um, and you start your app, and your competency is building an app, right? And you've done a really great job. You've deployed it in, you know, US East One or what have you. Um, and your customers really love it. People are joining the app. But suddenly there are people joining in South Africa and Hong Kong and stuff, right? And so then you have to think every time they press like, right, that interaction is round tripping over those submarine cables, right? <laughs> back to US East 1 and then back to the user. Um, and it creates, it can create unnecessarily bad experiences, right? And so then this is where things like CDNs have historically come into play, right? Like shove as many assets as you can that are static, as many places as you can so you can load them. But Fly tries to answer the question of what do you, if you didn't need a CDN? What if you could just put your app in all of those locations? And so you can you can do everything you need where you need it, and it's going to be fast for all of your users. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, so let's let's use the example comparison Vercel, just so like Next.js, there's probably a lot of listeners out there that use Next.js. Um, if I deployed a Vercel, all of my static files are are going out to a CDN, but they also have kind of their functions that run on the thunder side of that, which are in in lambdas essentially. I think they have like mostly a AWS backbone that's on there. So when I need to like make database calls or you know check anything on the server side, that's typically uh, kind of spinning in that lambda. How does flies kind of there isn't a cdn but your app moves over what does that look like for them so for an example um if we take uh if we take your social media site example one thing that we spent a lot of time doing is is talking about how do we run stateful applications at the edge right and so we have this thing called automated postgres where you can actually have, we we will bootstrap for you read replicas of your Postgres database everywhere that your app is. So suddenly when you're making a read request to your database in Hong Kong, in South Africa, you're making a read request against a database that's effectively right next to your app server versus wow. having to make that read request back to some central database. Uh, and that's just an example of the power that happens when, you're, when your compute is co-located with your users is you can you can do really cool stuff like that. Do you have to put any more kind of thought behind that? Like if you spin up a, a Postgres cluster, right? Um, and you provide a connection string to that, is that good enough? Or is there a lot more that a developer has to think about now deploying to fly? 
there there are some things you have to you have to think about right everything's a trade-off so for example sure. what are you going to do about rights right there's still a primary thing how are you going to get those rights to to your primary database and you're going to have to you know invent some new thing how are you going to try to do some like write forwarding proxy in front of postgres right all these ways that we've traditionally tried to solve it but what Flag tries to do is say, yes, there are these trade-offs. Yes, there are these extra things you have to think about, but we think it's valuable. So here, the, we're going to give you some primitives to try and make that easier. So an example is something we call Fly Replay, where if you if a user does uh, a request that's going to mutate something, let's say send a sends a like, um, we can the the app server can respond with this Fly Replay header which will instruct our overlay network to go replay that HTTP request against the primary one and send it back. And so then you can really easily split out the rights to your app, send them to the correct place, but still all those reads get, you know, how many likes does this post has, does this post have still get served from that Postgres instance sitting right there next to your app. Gotcha. That's pretty sweet. That's really cool. Yeah, Fly Replay is one of the coolest, I think, uh, like networking platform features we have because it makes it so easy to just say, uh, you know what? Actually, I I don't I'm I as the app server think something else different version of the app server should handle that request. Go do it over there, and our network will take care of that for you. Nice. I think I know the answer to this question, but currently you don't support Docker compose files, but typically like a Docker file is is good enough. And if you have to create multiples, that's fine, right? Yeah. So we don't we don't support Docker Compose, um, but we do we do our like our base unit is a, if you hand us a Docker file, we turn that into a VM. So yeah. That how so I'm used to like um, Google Cloud Run. How do you do that? Like, what's the technology under the hood? So this is this is pretty cool. So an OCI image is really a ray, a open container. And so open container image is really just a stack of tarballs. Wow. And okay. with some JSON that describes the specification that says where all these files are, where to download them from. Um, but what a regular Docker client does, or what you can do with, um, well, you could just do with Bash if you wanted. Uh, there's a there's a blog post about this on the fly.io blog. I can give you a link to put in the show notes if you want. But the uh, if you just uh, extract those tarballs on top of each other down the list, as far as the the spec, the JSON spec that comes with the image instructs you to do, you end up with the file system that is supposed to run uh, in that in that container. Wow, right. that's kind of incredible. So I I would have never thought that's how that functions. So I, I think you guys are using Firecracker, right? Yeah, exactly. So then what we do is we take that we have we now we have a file system and we put the rest of the things that make that a functioning virtual machine image, right? We get we have a kernel, we have an init, all those things. We put that all together and suddenly we have a virtual machine image. Obviously there's we do a bunch of other stuff to optimize that. So that's really fast. But that's that's the idea behind it. And then we run that in Firecracker. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, let me bring up uh, Firecracker. So this is, I think Firecracker was open sourced by AWS. Am I wrong? Yeah, by Amazon. This is from Lambda. That's really cool. That's it's kind of that next step of you know some of these software companies that are massive when they're when they need things like this, they actually open source them. And I I, I believe this is open source fully. Um, yeah. So that, so that other people can use it like fly.io. That's really cool. No, it's super cool technology. Um, you know, and it's it's super fast and it, we've it's a lot, we've been able to push it pretty far. Um, you know, we we do a lot of different stuff with it. We hook it into our networking infrastructure, our storage infrastructure, um, all that, all that good stuff. And when we're when we're taking like that firecracker piece, um, and you look at it from a testing standpoint, right? So we're back to that social media app. I'm I'm just going to use Next.js as an example again. That app we can test and just run. Uh, it's typically like a node server or whatever locally that's running. But if you want to test out your actual um, fly.io, is that going to be? Should you test it in a Docker container locally um, using like Docker desktop is not the right word, but just the Docker CLI. 
when that spins that up is that one to one with what's happening on fly.io or should you be using like flies cli to like somehow test that locally it's so it's not exactly one to one right there are some subtle differences uh but generally the a really common pattern is people develop locally with docker um like if if stuff breaks between what you're doing locally in docker and what's happening that's usually a bug we, we usually want to fix that um the the real thing where stuff gets different is if you start using platform specific features of fly and then you're going to want to test those on on fly actually so if you're using our networking features if you're using our storage features if you're using any of that um then you or our init features or any of those then you would want to actually test it on fly, on fly right which is why we want to make it really quick to deploy and all of that uh so that that is easy to do but yeah so it's a little a little bit of both is the answer to that question sure are you able to like create a shell out to those services and test those locally then without having to like push to fly all the time to to run a test you can or like, shell like into tunnel. running so you, you can tunnel you can you can tunnel to your the network the you know sort of private network that you get in a fly app or fly organization but to actually deploy a new version you need to go through uh the deploy process but that should be pretty quick the the longest part of that is almost always uh just building a docker image okay which if if you've if it's you know a fairly normal docker image where docker has gotten pretty good at caching and all that and we support that we support caching uh, layers and all of that, even in our remote builders uh, that people can use if they don't want to build locally. We we support having an image cache and all of that so that it's hopefully very fast. And how do you start to dictate, like, my my app started out as just me and my friends on my social app for our continued example here. And uh, it's it's grown, right? I have a thousand users now. Um, you know, I, I had deployed, I work at FusionAuth. With, I've deployed out my FusionAuth instance and it's really getting hammered as we're growing. How do you go about scaling and like replication globally? Right. So, it, I mean, right. So this partially depends on how stateful slash stateless your app is. But at the like at the very base platform level, if you we express that with the fly scale command. Okay. So you can do all the normal types of scaling, horizontal, vertical, whatever you need. You can add more instances. You can add more instances in different regions, add regions to the pool. You can, or you can just increase the instance size, say, you know what, this is, this is pretty stateful. And I don't want to have to think about making that, splitting that out yet, even though fly gives you the primitives to hopefully make that pretty easy. And you can just say, you know what, give me, give me a beefy machine with, with a bunch of cores and a bunch of, bunch of RAM, and I don't have to deal with it for another few months. And that's fine too. <laughs> nice. Even though we do, we do of course recommend running multiple instances for redundancy sake, but cool. I keep hearing the uh, Taylor Swift effect uh, now. So, like, if if she releases a concert date, you want to scale up quick. You just punch in the command yeah. and let it go, huh? Yeah, fly scale count, and you can say, you know, a thousand, and we'll we'll go and we'll we'll place those for you. Nice. Um, let's talk a, a minute about kind of organizationally. Like when I am working in GCP or something like that, uh, there's this idea of an organization and then projects that sit with uh, sit under that. And when you start to deal with kind of your networking side of that, everything within that organization or within that project, um, depending on how you set it up, like the VPCs start to, you can set them up so that those apps can only talk to each other not out to the internet, things like that. How does that work on fly when you're like deploying three different Docker instances? Can they talk together on just yeah. fly itself? Yeah. So this is this is really this is really cool. This is one of my favorite um one of my favorite things about the platform is this networking uh is our is our networking features. So basically every organization in so the to back up a second, it's sort of similar in that there is an organization. An organization has a number of apps is sort of the default, uh, the default relational model in Fly. And so there is within an organization this big wire guard mesh, basically, where stuff can talk to each other. Um, and then within that, we have uh, different apps. And so different apps can talk to each other within the organization unless you explicitly lock that down. But the idea is with WireGuard, it all just it it all just works. 
which is pretty like magical is as long as you just hit the private IP of one of their one of your other instances and it it should just magically through the power of wire guard appear that it's right next to you. Um, and so that's that's the like internal networking feature. And then you can, of course, because it's just wire guard, you can add arbitrary devices so you can create a wire guard peer and set up your laptop as you're developing to be a part of your uh, oh, interesting network. Yeah. So I have the like wire guard app set up on my on my Mac. And whenever I'm testing stuff uh, and I just want to curl my internal services uh, locally, I just turn on the wire guard thing. And now my my laptop is part of the is a wire guard peer in the internal network, which is pretty cool. That is pretty wild. I would have never. Th I haven't used WireGuard. That's pretty uh, nifty technology to be able to do that. Yeah, WireGuard is. It's. Um, I'm not sure how much you've heard about it. It's like it's a sort of peer-to-peer -peer mesh networking layer VPN like thing. It sort of it does it does a lot. It's the technology that powers TailScale, right? Um, TailScale is all WireGuard peer-to-peer, -peer. Um, and so we have this this giant all of our all of our hosts in our uh in our fleet have these wire guard connections between each other so all of our hosts can just talk to each other and then we have these uh wire guard networks for all of our all of our users so all of our users can have just this magic network that works no matter where their instances actually are located it's just easy for them to talk to each other that's really cool and then that's like all ipv6 that's floating around inside there yeah, we're it's mostly it's pretty much IPv6 native internally. Cool. Um, I have on my list of questions uh, Postgres. Very curious yeah. about the level of it. There's a kind of a, a blog post, and then in your docs it says like this isn't full blown Postgres. Can you tell me more if people are interested in kind of going down that road? How far you should take it? Yeah. So I mean, we we are. We're fans of Postgres, a lot of us at Fly, as you can tell from our public writings. Um, the disclaimer that you're talking about is that the Postgres that we provide when you type like Fly, CTL, PG, Create, yep. is uh, what we call automated, which is different than managed Postgres, right? We will, we will create an app on Fly for you that has Postgres all set up, but the difference is... Um, it's not managed in that it's just a regular fly app that belongs to you. It doesn't have any privileged access. It just runs Docker files with some glue code that we wrote that's open source. And it does all of that. Whereas a managed service from someone like Supabase or uh, uh, Aven or folks like that, if it breaks, that is the, that's the job of the provider to solve. Um, which is different because in, in, with Fly Automated Postgres, we'll set it up for you. But if you if it breaks, if you mess it up, that's it's your app to figure out what to do. Um, okay. Is is the explainer behind that? Uh, that said, we do have um, we do have managed Postgres partners that will be announcing soon, who will be actually running a managed Postgres service. All the all the compute happens on fly. Um, it's but it will be managed by one of those companies. Hot take. Uh, Hot take. Yes, that's that's, uh, you know, watch the space. But so that's that's the first part of that is it explains sort of long explainer to that particular caveat in the docs. Um, but then should you use it for more than just development? Uh, we think so. I mean, our our sort of our monolith is Postgres backed at Fly. We still have a, oh, okay. we still have an API monolith that handles like user stuff and all of that. Um, and we think you know with with replication at the edge, you can do some pretty powerful stuff with that, right? You can have these read replicas. Uh, you can you can rewrite locally, not write locally. Uh, you can read locally and then just write in your primary region. But again, it's like it's a very I I, I hesitate to make like a, a sweeping statement about what what my opinion of if you should use Postgres for more than <laughs> development, because I don't know, like consult your local uh, consult your local platform developers and 
people with strong opinions about databases because you'll always have some. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, like we're also big on, on SQLite. We think SQLite is really powerful and there's a lot more that you can do with that. Um, so we have something called LightFS Cloud, which is, uh, you know, uh, cloud backing for LightFS, which is our replicated SQLite offering. And so basically this is all to say, uh, yeah, I think Postgres is pretty powerful for a whole bunch of situations, probably not the best for all of them. There are a bunch of different options. <laughs> Oh, I like it. That's that's really cool breakdown. Um, you talk about kind of the, the, your services that you provide. Um, what other ones should people know about? So like S3 buckets, storage, what what else is hiding in the, the fly.io universe? Um, object hiding storage also word. coming through a partner um, will be announced soon. Um, I think you guys have Redis, right? Uh, we do have Redis through Upstash. Okay. Um, right. So this is this is a thing I mentioned Joshua earlier, who works on partnerships, which is um, right. Fly.io has a lot of really powerful primitives if you want to build a platform, right? But not everyone wants to build a platform. Not yeah. everyone wants to be responsible for their own Postgres. Not everyone wants to be woken up in the middle of the night if their Postgres breaks. That's fine. <laughs> like I don't I don't like being woken up in the middle of the night because our Postgres breaks. Um, but because we have these primitives that a bunch of companies have decided are really powerful for building platforms on top of, we've decided to sort of work with partners to build out some of those more um, managed services on top of our infra. So it's all within our networking. You get all those features, but it's from someone whose core competency is, in the case of Upstash, running Redis. So they run our managed Redis offering, or there will be other companies that do managed Postgres, managed, et cetera. True. Um, and so that's 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 all in the in the works. Uh, we have a Century partnership, a bunch of different partnerships there, and then um, other things you should look out for. Fly, LightFS is pretty awesome. Um, ben Johnson, who knows a ton about SQLite, is working on that at Fly. Our, uh, you know, I've been talking it up a lot, but our networking features, the proxy is really powerful, right? This edge proxy that knows how to route to all of our instances. It's doing the Mac OS thumbs up thing. Um, and yeah, I think those are, those are, those are the big things that I think right now are, are super cool and exciting. And, oh, of course I forgot GPU instances are now coming online and are just oh. available are in the hands of our first users. So a lot of a lot of AI type stuff happening there. Yes, and building I almost and I stuff. almost forgot that that's a big one. Um, so fly.io slash GPUs if you want to get access. Wow, I'm, I'm typing it in right now. GPUs. Well, this is embarrassing. I apparently went to the wrong. Let's try nope. again. Is it just Did GPU? I, it might just be GPU shows what I know. Yes, it's just GPU. Joining the list. Yes. Um, so to uh, create LLMs. There you go. Is that good enough? Yes. So we're 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 letting people off the wait list pretty quickly now. Uh, as we can it's really a matter of how fast we can we can source new GPUs and get them online uh, versus the cool. demand is is crazy right now. Love it. Uh, just a a little little pitch for myself. I wrote this article uh, not that long ago, and it's got Upstash in it, but a big comparison on all of the different uh, serverless application provider or databases for serverless applications. Um, so give that a read if you're curious about like what Upstash does and kind of how it works and things like that. And you should be able to tie that into Flight.io. Yeah, I'll get no, off my pedestal. Cool. Though. No, it's that's a good it's a good comparison. Um, I want to know, because I think you're super passionate about this since you were doing it before you were working there. When I look at services like Fly, super easy to like, I just wrote a, a tutorial on, at FusionAuth, how to run FusionAuth and create a Postgres database and like get up and running. But that's like simple, non-production-ish, like toying around. When we look at what you did with Terraform, let's talk about like, CI CD pipelines and fly and Terraform and like why people would go down that road and how it works. Yeah. So the, <laughs> the sort of funny story with Terraform specifically is that that one is being handed back to the community uh, to work on just because uh, 
you know, it's don't have enough, enough time, enough people, which is sure. constantly the problem <laughs> uh, with a fairly new company. But the the ideas behind it, um, we still care about. Um, you know, it should be easy to run these large, large complex apps and reason about them. So like our config file fly.toml has a lot of different configurations, um, a different configuration to try and make that easier and split up your app and control that. I believe you can even include other files in your fly.toml, uh, which is a non-standard extension. Um, we have, uh, we have what? templates for hooking it up to GitHub Actions and all of that. That's what I was just going to ask. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So we have templates for hooking up to GitHub Actions. There's actually someone who um, is creating, has created a product called, I believe, Fly CD, which is they're doing a managed continuous integration deployment, um, uh, like CI provider for Fly, which is really awesome. That's a, that's a community project. Um, that's really cool. So but, let's, yes. let's talk a minute just for people that aren't used to this. Um, I, I know there's a lot of devs out there that are like front end devs um, that listen to this. So a workflow that you would get into, you would create an application, you would create a Docker file for that application, but you might need like that thing has a database and it has a X. And so there might be four applications that actually need to get spun out to fly. In your GitHub Actions, you're actually taking those and using like the Fly CLI to send those out. Yeah, basically, it's just it's um, it's it's hooked directly up to the Fly CLI and just runs the uh runs the commands that are needed. Almost, I I know I said I wouldn't share my screen, but if it's fine, I can sort of show an example. Share away, I love it. Perfect. So here is this. Uh, this is my personal site. And so this is a Remix app deployed to Fly. Cool. And so we can see here that the deploy is pretty standard. Um, it has obviously tests, but the the like interesting part is really we just run the Fly CTL deploy command, and this is almost identical to what you would do um, what you do locally. Uh, the only difference is I, I build my image in GitHub Actions just because I think I once upon a time I was testing something and I haven't changed it back. But this is exactly the same. Um, this is exactly the same as you would do locally. And you can see we have this uh, GitHub Action that you can pull in that brings the fly CTL command into scope. And so anything you can do, uh, anything you can do locally, you can do in GitHub Actions. And so nice. we make that easy. Yeah. Then, I love the remix example. That's cool. Yes, I'm 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 a remix fan, but you know, that is that is that is me. You should create a maybe there is one a fly stack, right? All the the remix stacks. I believe a bunch of the actually the native uh, remix stacks are. That's a good point. They are are fly.io based. I think the even other... um, so the the big one is is always can't see Dodds. He has his what epic stack something like that. Yes, um, that's a lot of that is uh, fly.io. So definitely Fly, check that yeah. out if you guys are React slash Remix fans. His personal site is uh, on Remix. He's actually a big big user of um, Remix. And then the other thing that I just wanted to demo really quick, if we have one more second. Yeah. Now that we're now that we're here, because I had an idea. Here's, here's that uh, epic stack. I'll have to remember to put this in our in our doc. Is present share screen. Share I had this screen. stood up on Coding Cat just for an example to check out at one point. So it's it's pretty straightforward. It's cool to run locally too. If you if you tell me the commands or where to go, I I can probably uh share it let's see here here's my i term all right do you have the fly cli installed of course all right all right this is this will be this will be a fun I... this will be a fun demo all right i will <laughs> let me see I'll which put... fly account i'm logged into though uh what is is it fly auth uh yeah i auth status 
I believe it's who am I will show you who you're currently. Yeah. I just, I have a feeling I might be in my work account. What is happening right now? Oh, it auto updated you. Yeah. Let me log out. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. That'll open it in your browser to. All right. Sweet. Okay. Hit me. All right. Uh, so I sent you a link to. Um, pull the Django? To, yeah. Okay. If you want to pull that repository. Sure. Uh, da, da, da. All right. And then. You know what? I'm going to just quickly switch over to VS Code Share um, so that Sounds we good. can kind of look at it a little more. All right. Um, so I brought down the bun um, repository in here. Doesn't appear to be anything fly related or Docker images. Right? Yeah. So okay. this is why this might this will be a decent example. So if you pop up in a terminal. OK. And you do fly launch. We should see some we should see some cool stuff. So it detected the type of app and you can give it a name or we can generate one. Your is, call. It, is it still technically node if it's a bun? I don't uh, know. Yeah, I guess I guess not. <laughs> um, bun, sure. Cool, Let's I'm going to put it close to me, which is where? Um, what's closest to Michigan? Uh, uh, Ohio question. or... Uh, Chicago? Chicago work. Yeah, Chicago might be. So oh, you know what it is? If you it is I ran bun install and it detected the lock file was the thing that clued it that it was a okay. bun app instead of Node.js. Okay. Let's do bun uh oops. I should remove my PMP lock too. All right, there. We're back to base ish. And I'll do bun install. And now nice. if I do fly launch, uh, yeah, fly launch, bring cat bun two. There we go. And Sweet. if we look at that Docker file now, I bet you it will have generated the correct one. Yes, oh, there yeah. we go. Perfect. And so you can see that's part of what Fly Launch tries to do is guess about your app. And that's hard because of the like state of front end in particular. There's yeah. there's so many clues about what something can be. Uh, so I will I will I will be filing an issue after this to try and see if we can be more clever about detecting bun even before first install, because for a lot of languages and uh, frameworks, we can detect that. But the difference between like bun versus the node runtime is so subtle. I guess it, I understand why uh, when that was built, it yeah. relied on that. But For if you sure. type fly deploy now, what we'll see here is that it'll take your remote builder, right? Which we give everyone for free. And this is where it'll do all your Docker builds for you, which is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's see. Is that bun.lockb in Docker ignore, I wonder? does seem that way. Check Docker ignore, not just git ignore. The git ignore wouldn't have a. Oh, sorry. Wait. You're right. My bad. Yes. Yeah, that last one. I'm curious if you tried deleting that. This is this is good. We're creating a whole lot of we're creating lots of issues for me to file after this. Let's see here. Yeah, I so might have to go. retitle our episode to "Fly with Bun." Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll put a I'll Check. put a little uh, hot air balloon with the bun taking off. I think we actually have from our Illustrator. We have somewhere a uh, "Fly Hearts Bun" logo. Oh, nice! Send it over. I'll use it. I will. <laughs> I'll I'll pass it along. Um, but what we can see here, right, is that the remote builder is pushing to our registry, um, and this is again all happening. Uh, not actually on your device, 
which is really nice if you're working on a resource constrained device. Yeah. Um, and or you're doing a lot of these at a time. Uh, or it's a really big one, etc. So you can see here it's gone. It's provisioned IPs uh, for the app and it's cool. creating a new machine, which is a virtual machine. And so that is making to launch more than one machine per app. Creating a second machine to increase service availability. You're fine. We don't need service availability for this example. <laughs> Ignore that error. OK. Um, and so if you go to coding cat uh, bun dash bun two dot fly dot dev, or you curl it if you want to do that in your um, uh, terminal. Sorry. Uh, what am I going to? If you curl coding cat uh, dash bun two dot fly dot dev. What we should see, hopefully, hmm. I do see it on. You know what? I wonder if I have to do the full. Yep. Oh, yep. There you go. Welcome to Bunny. Right. I don't know what slash is, but I like it. Oh, I think it's the root, root. Yeah. The root directory. Uh, serve oh, it's Chicago. sorry. It's because I, I didn't the curl before didn't use HTTPS, which I think the app probably requires was there. Oops. But no, yeah, so that's that, that, that's, that's really a super cool. convoluted example of running a fly launch and deploy. Yeah, I, I would imagine like once you have this kind of, uh, you know, straightened out and like streamlined, uh, all this stuff is super quick. So uh, at this point, we talk about that, like replication and stuff like that. I could take my bun app that's sitting in Chicago. And if I wanted to, like the kind of the error suggested there, what what would be the command to say, create it in our, did we say Africa or Hong Kong? What, how about that? Uh so that belongs to the uh, fly scale submenu, I believe. Okay. And so from there, you can uh, add new regions. You can add new. Um, yeah, you can add or uh, fly scale does count. And then I believe you can do fly regions. Yeah. And then you can add list, remove all those uh, nice. to the, the pool that your app will get deployed to every time. Cool. That's very neat. I mean, it's super straightforward. We had a couple of hiccups. Uh, we'll, we'll edit those out uh, or maybe yes. we'll make a B-roll out of them because they're hilarious. Uh, they're, they're, they're fun. It's this is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in 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 general, you will have an actual people will be deploying an app they know something about rather than grabbing an arbitrary example, uh, which will exactly. make that easier. Um, yeah. Oh, I love it. Um, I'm going to roll us into our perfect picks. I'll give you a minute to, uh, to kind of think yours. I know you're still pondering still, uh, is, does it have to be tech related or can I do not at all? It could be okay, a great. Netflix show. It could be like whatever you would like to share that you're excited about. All right. Then I've, I've, I got it. Okay. I'm going to just show mine since I have it on the screen real quick. Um, so launch week century, uh, they're dropping some cool stuff. I have just added uh, Sentry to Coding Cat Dev like a week ago, maybe. Um, I went through the rate limit, crazy, uh, which they're like, are you running this in production? You must have a heavily hit site. I'm like, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're not a major site. So uh, some interesting things there. I think the team's going to come hang out with us on the podcast uh, to talk about some of the new stuff and be able to dive into like what's slow on our site and how do we fix it and things like that. So catch that next time um other than that i don't have a screenshot for it uh, the lions won i'm super pumped about how well they're doing so that's it that's my perfect picks there we go mine oh, is uh mine is the morning show on apple tv just watch the finale of it it was very yeah. was very good some there's some very good well, tell me the ending i haven't watched the last episode i will not tell you i will not tell you the ending but there's there's some very good there's some very good acting in the in the last episode that i really enjoyed so i i recommend that if you uh have the if you if you're a fan of you know high stress winding <laughs> down at the end of the day 
Yeah, I really like to wind down with like, I don't know, uh, racism, like sexual misconduct. I yeah, don't know right. What's going on in this show, but it's intense. <laughs> Yes, that's the thing with like a uh, intense uh, prestige television. I'm like, and I'm doing this to myself for fun. <laughs> I will say it's been interesting that the way that that show is run, where it kind of took us through like pre COVID, COVID, like it rolled through those eras and kind of uh, the what were the different movements that they've covered? Probably all of them. Uh, anyways, it's kind of like almost a history in a show based setup. So it's, it's yeah. cool. No, it's, it's a fun well done. I really appreciate it. Thank you for spending some time with me uh, talking about fly.io. Uh, we'll have to have you on again. I feel like you guys are going to drop some, some hot takes here soon and we're going to have to show them off again. Hopefully. Yes, we will. We, we, we are, we are excellent uh, in my opinion, proprietors of hot takes on the internet. So <laughs> Very cool. All right. We'll catch you next time. See you. All right. Thank you.